So let's do it properly. Let's actually integrate to work out how long it takes to fall through the Earth. So, what do we know in a situation where gravity isn't constant? In general terms, if you've got position x, we can differentiate that with respect to time and dx by dt gives us v. So the rate of change of position with time is the velocity. Nothing controversial yet. We can then differentiate that. And if you do dv by d t, so the rate that velocity is changing over time, that gives you the acceleration. And that is completely general. That works for any situation. It doesn't matter what acceleration is or what that depends on. This all holds. But it's not a whole lot of insight into the situation. We can squeeze one more equation out of it, though. If we combine these together, let's do v divided by a. So if we have v divided by a, that equals, well, it's that divided by that. So it's going to be dx by dt divided by dv by dt. I'm now going to do something which will cause a little bit of pain for the absolute purists amongst us. I am going to treat my derivative friends here as if they were fractions for a second. I um, recommend looking away if you find this kind of thing uncomfortable because I'm just going to remove those dt's and I'm going to rewrite that as equals dx on dv. Now this is quite an interesting relationship. It means that v divided by a, velocity divided by acceleration, is the same ratio as small change x small or oh, dx dv. Let's not go too far from the path. And if we want to rearrange that slightly, it means that the velocity times dv, if I bring that over, equals the acceleration by dx, if I bring that over. And this is particularly useful for us because our acceleration is in terms of position. Actually, we should get the acceleration in terms of distance. So before we had force equals g times the mass of our object times the density of the Earth times 4 pi on 3. And we put all of that outside of uh, distance. Now, the great thing is that force also equals mass times acceleration. And there's our mass in there. In fact, if we take that mass out from in there and we pop it out the front, there's our mass. All of this is then our acceleration. So our acceleration as a function of position equals all of this rubbish times x. And to make our life slightly more simple, I'm going to take all of this. I'm going to call that blah. So blah, which means now we can simplify acceleration as a function of distance equals blah times position x. OK, let's put it all together. So from before, we had we can now replace that acceleration. It equals uh, blee some blah times x dx. Over here, we've still got v dv, and we can tidy this up by integrating both sides. There we go. Now, integrating v dv is nice and straightforward. You may remember doing this at school, or if you haven't done it yet, spoiler alert, it is v squared on 2. If anyone's unconvinced, try differentiating that. Make sure you're happy you get back to v. And then this side over here, the, b, the b's are constant. So I'm just going to put that out the front where it's not going to hurt anyone. And then it's the same deal here. You're going to end up with x squared on 2. Now, a lot of you are getting a bit twitchy because I haven't put plus a constant. And technically, yes, with all this together, there's going to be some constant hanging out over there. But I now want to regeneralize this. Uh, so it's a function of x as you go plummeting through the planet. So what I'm going to do is actually work this out as a definite integral. I'm going to work that out from at the beginning of your fall, your x value is the radius of the Earth. So you start up here at big R radius of the Earth. And then as you fall down, your new position is the variable x. And so I can just put these into that. And so it's going to equal b outside of x goes in first. So that's x squared on 2. No big surprises there. And then we subtract, put r in, r squared on 2. No need to worry about any ridiculous plus a constant. And we can now tidy this up a smidgen. We've got a 2 over there. Nobody needs b outside of x squared minus r 
squared. And then if we want to get rid of the square root, uh, sorry, go to the squared, we can just square root that whole side. And so there, I've now got velocity as a function of position x. And now before we carry too much further on, I'm going to sneak a negative in here when no one's looking, partly because I could have kept that originally when I set up the force equals because acceleration is down, I'm measuring x up. Or here, if you don't get too emotional about it, before v squared equals what's in the middle. And so v equals the negative of the square root as well. I'm going to basically, I'm going to need that later on. And this is the nicest place to put it in where I'm going to get the fewest complaints. If you've got a major issue with that, tough. Do it your way. So uh, over here, this is velocity, but we know from before that velocity is just the rate of change of position. And so over here, I'm going to put a dx by dt. Okay, all we have to do now is shuffle these around into new positions and we can integrate again. I mean, that root b is still a constant and it's a bit annoying being under there. So I'm going to move a negative, the square root of blah, which is itself some new and improved constant times dt equals everything under there dx. If we integrate both sides, let's chuck that in there, chuck that in there. This side is nice and straightforward. It's 1. If you integrate 1, you get that variable. You get t. And that is exactly what we're trying to do. Just by doing integration, we've finally got t by itself. Oh yeah, okay, it's multiplied by negative the square root of blah, but that's nobody's business. The point is, we can calculate that constant. We've now got t by itself. All we have to do is work out what is... Oh my goodness. Okay, okay, now uh, unfortunately, integrating this is a mess. If you want the short answer of how you go about integrating a monstrosity like, well, the long way is a whole bunch of complicated substitutions. And if you want to try that, be my guest. I'm going to skip straight to the punchline because in reality, what I do when I'm faced with that is I chuck it into Wolfram Alpha and it kicks out an answer. In this case, the answer is, it is the inverse tan, love it, of x over what we've got there from before, the square root of x squared minus r squared. And that goes in there. I close that up. And now finally, we don't want to keep this general anymore. We want to actually squeeze a value out of it for time. And so when you plummet from the surface of the Earth, when you start at uh, the Earth's radius, you go all the way into the center of the Earth. And then we're going to just double the answer we get. You go down to zero. And so now we just chuck the values in, we're finally going to get t. Righty-o, the gripping conclusion. Okay, so we've got to substitute everything in. So I'm going to put it all down here so it doesn't get in the way. Oh, so the inverse tan of x, oh, uh, zero is going in first. That's going to be zero on top of who cares? Because that whole thing is going to be uh, zero and the inverse tan of zero is zero. What are we putting in this time? Uh, the radius of the Earth. Okay, so we can put that in, no problem. So at the top there, uh, x becomes radius of the Earth divided by the square root of uh, the radius of the Earth squared minus the radius of the Earth squared. Okay, now uh, possibly that could be a little bit of a problem because what we've now uh, got to do here to get our final value, which is going to go in there, is evaluate the inverse tan of this, which has got uh, radius squared minus radius squared, which is going to equal zero. The square root of zero is pretty reliably zero. We've now got to do the radius of the Earth divided by uh, zero. And as long-term viewers of my videos will appreciate, I do not enjoy dividing by zero. It is only in extreme situations I can be convinced to deal with it as if it was infinity. Are we going to be allowed to do that? Because, I mean, technically, you could say this is the inverse tan of infinity because as you're, as you're plummeting down through the Earth, you're approaching zero, right? So in fact, I could have done this for a ridiculously small value, point zero, zero. I could do it dangerously close, or let's just call it zero. So in fact, this value here explodes infinitely large, which that sounds a bit familiar when it comes to tan. So uh, come with me over here very quickly. Here is a plot of my uh, angle. Let's just call it theta, why not? And I'm now going to plot tan of 
theta and you get that classic. Here it comes swooping up and then off and it wraps all the way around reality as we know it and it comes back in the bottom here and then goes around there and off and again around through reality, goodness knows where it goes, back in again here. And so this is our classic tan plot. You get these points here, these asymptotes that go one there, one there, and they carry all the way along and you look at the value right there. So what hypothetically goes into a tan function, so this yellow one is my plot of tan of theta, if I want to get the, the, bit, the bit where it's exploded off to infinity and work out what it would have been on the axis here, in this case, theta would have been pi on two. I would argue that the inverse tan of something that explodes to infinity is pi on two. Now I know I'm gonna get a lot of angry emails and letters Yes, I do get physical letters and tweets and YouTube comments. Only kidding, you all leave lovely YouTube comments. But I, you know, people are gonna be a little upset that I'm claiming this, but if you go with me on that, it makes this line up really nicely. Because now we can put in the inverse tan of something exploding to infinity is pi on two and well technically it's negative pi on two but that's why I kept a negative in the bank from before we can get rid of that we can put the root blur on this side which means that the time that it takes to go all the way through the earth is pi on two times the square root of one over blah but actually this time we've been working on is just from the surface down to the core you've got to go all the way out the other side our actual time to go all the way through the planet equals pi outside of the square root of one over blah Okay, now to bring this thing home. So the time to go all the way from here, right to the center of the earth, out the other side, that total time, which actually, you know what, that's gonna be a capital T from now on. Capital T as opposed to lowercase t, which we had for halfway before. That time equals pi times the square root of one over b for blah. Let's all remember that b for blah equals. And so if we've got one over and you can put all those values in. Oh, and if you are playing along at home and you want to use the same values I am, I have been using the radius of the earth, big g, and then I've taken the mass of the earth to equal around about a to the 24 uh, kilograms. Or if you want units on big G, look it up. And if you take all of those and put them in there, of course, out the other side comes 2530.5 seconds. We got the same answer. But actually, while we were doing that, something even more amazing has happened. Do you remember way back when we did this as a simple harmonic system, we had that k value. Well, if you think blah looks a bit familiar, it's because it's very, very similar to k. k was exactly the same thing, had big G, but then it had the mass of the object, and then it had rho four pi on three. And so actually we can link blah to the k value from our harmonic system before. It's just that m there. So actually, b equals k divided by m. And you're like, well, hang on a second. That means that the inverse of b is m on k. And so if we take the equation we worked out by doing long, lengthy integration, that t, the half period, equals pi outside of the square root. What is 1 on b? Well, that's going to be m on k. That is exactly the equation I told you to take on faith before, and we just derived it using integration. I'm going to struggle to overstate how amazing this is because that k value, this definition here, we used that well before we realized it was a simple harmonic oscillator. That k dropped out of the equation. What we did at the same time, because of the way we arrange things as blahs and k's, we were simultaneously able to start with a system where the force that causes the acceleration is uh, based on the distance from the center, and we derived this. We have accidentally derived 
saved a simple harmonic oscillator. I cannot tell you how pleased I am with that.